broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone today to our webinar with Dr. Susan Maloney on behalf of the International Bipolar Foundation. Dr. Susan Maloney has worked as a nurse for 25 years and a family nurse practitioner for 16 years in a myriad of settings, including internal medicine, older adults, college health, and women's health and mental health issues. Susan is currently teaching full-time at Edinburgh University in the nursing department, where she has taught mental health nursing for the last 10 years. Her doctorate is in health psychology and maintains a private practice where she conducts seminars, health coaching, and individual counsel related to depression issues, and also nutrition, fitness, and body image issues. In addition, Susan works part-time as a personal trainer and has completed, competed as a professional lightweight athlete for several years. She is a spokesperson for the National Celiac Aware Awareness Foundation, NFCA, having been diagnosed with celiac disease three years ago. Susan hosts several gluten-free blog sites and is working on publishing a handbook on the extra intestinal symptoms of celiac disease. Most recently, Susan spoke at the National NAMI conference this year in San Antonio and was honored to be asked to do so. She is active in her local mental health awareness program in Crawford County, CHAPS, as both a board member and a health educator. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. I appreciate uh, being invited to be here and speak with all of you today. Um, especially to launch off with the extra intestinal symptoms right before your mid-afternoon lunch <laughs> snack. <laughs> um, no, uh, truly, I, it's a privilege for me to be able to share what I really think has helped me to maximize my own health and wellness. My presentation today is probably not going to be anything earth breaking, shattering, um, new research, cellular level kinds of information. But what I have found is that it's the everyday stuff of life that I know I myself need reminded of. And as Debbie shared, um, a couple of years ago I was, I was diagnosed with celiac disease, which kind of briefly is a, an allergy to wheat and gluten and a lot of food related things. And interestingly with that came a a real change in my level of motivation and energy and I had mood changes and without really being formally diagnosed with a mental health issue I'd never struggled with you know feelings of depression and not having my usual energy and motivation and um, same kind of fitness level that I always had so it was really a a check for me to uh, which I hope has helped me to better understand the clients that I work with be more compassionate and empathetic towards myself and hopefully uh, in the message that I have to share with you today. So again, thank you for having me. Um, by the end of our program today, we're going to look at uh, taking a wellness inventory and this is not, uh, I am a professor, but I will promise I am not handing out grades. <laughs> this is not something for you to say, oh my gosh, I'm not doing well. It really is a, a process of looking at where am I today with my current feelings of wellness as I sit, stand, wherever you're at, you know, right this moment with your feelings about your health and wellness and um, helping us also to maybe look at some health limiting beliefs that we might currently hold about our, our wellness potential. When I was diagnosed with celiac disease, I felt that um, it kind of negatively impacted my health and I didn't realize some of the angry and negative feelings I was holding and how that was really affecting my ability to do all the things that I wanted to do each day um, from everything from physical energy to my own spiritual practice. So that was important for me when I kind of had that aha moment and looked at, wow, I'm really limiting what my wellness potential could be just by what I'm thinking and believing about myself. Whether that be a formal mental health diagnosis or just how we're feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. So that uh, I hope will be something that, that maybe will help you to gain some insight as well looking at learning practical ways to change or enhance current health practices. You may be, you know, given a gold star at the end of uh, our program. You know what, I'm really doing quite well. Uh, looking at maybe we need to adopt new thoughts, new behaviors, and new practices to help optimize your own wellness. 
and really helping all of us to look at what are your own personal health goals. Um, Debbie mentioned that I, I do work uh, part-time as a personal trainer and a lot of uh, folks come to me with diet and exercise questions and how can I maybe lose some weight here and uh, I could say eat salmon and broccoli three times a week but if you don't like salmon and broccoli you're probably not going to be successful and you're not going to eat it. So my hope is that we'll look at what are your own personal health goals and uh, how do I help you know look at ways to maximize that? And I think what's important, I'm, I'm on slide four if, if you're able to visually follow along here. When you are um, sitting with some kind of um, dis-ease or health issue that affects you in one area of your life or more, I think what's this the purpose of this wheel, this wellness inventory, is to help remind us that we're more than just one thing. We're more than just a um, a person who has been diagnosed with bipolar or schizophrenia or major depression or whatever that might be. So a lot, looking at that wheel, yes, that, that may affect a, a component of our feelings, but if on any given day and any, any given hour we remember that, you know what, I can sense that other people care about me. I'm remembering that I need to eat all of my meals because I'm diabetic as well. I'm moving, I'm active, I'm exercising, I'm scheduling in some play time, especially now in this busy, hectic, uh, kind of chaotic time of, of year. I have effective communication and, and I'm able to maintain some intimacy with the people in my life. So even on a day when we're not physically or emotionally feeling well, the purpose of this slide is to remind us that there's a lot of other big, big pieces to ourselves that really can um, help us when we're not feeling well on any given day. So I like this this wheel. It, it, it's a visual reminder. Uh, if you happen to be a visual learner, I kind of am. And moving along, you know, just kind of checking in. How are you feeling? How well are you today? I think on any given day, we run the gamut of anywhere along this um, health and wellness uh, continuum. Here is first thing in the morning before I've entered out into traffic, healthy. <laughs> um, so kind of just do a self check. You know, did I sleep well last night? Do I have fairly good energy. It's two o'clock in the afternoon there in California where you folks are. It's five o'clock here in chilly northwestern Pennsylvania, 24 degrees. Um, am I performing well? Do I have a sense of humor? Or am I further along on that continuum? Am I, you know, really, I just don't feel well. I did not sleep last night. I'm struggling with addiction. I'm anxious. I'm angry. Um, you know, where are you? And again, not to be judging ourselves as good, bad, or indifferent, but just Wow, owning you know wherever we're at today with our wellness. This next little um, inventory is not designed to be a quiz. And if you happen to be a numbers person and you're trying to figure out, okay, if I get a, a, a high score and answer all threes, it means one thing, or is the goal to have a low score? There's absolutely no correlation with the, how these numbers work themselves out. And I almost took them off, but then I left them on there because the purpose is looking at where am I at today because I think our health and wellness and our thoughts about how we are on any given day can change day to day. We may have a good day. We may have a day where symptoms relapse and the next day we're not as well feeling. So take this little wellness inventory today, score it with whatever the silly numbers are there, again, that don't really correlate with um, a particular uh, anything. Um, but then, you know, maybe you decide at the end of, of this webinar, hopefully, you know, there are maybe are some um, healthier ways and practices, things that I could incorporate into my life. Take and in, implement those, those changes and then retake this wellness inventory if you have um, access. I'll have to ask uh, my, uh, my help here if you have copies of this, uh, these PowerPoint slides to take home with you. I, I certainly hope that you do and, and if not, during the question and answer time, I will um, make available how we can do that. Um, but then retake the inventory and see what your score is and then just to kind of compare it. So just briefly, look, you know, we can ask ourselves these questions. Making basic changes in my life to improve my health is something I often think about. And the reason there's no right or wrong answer is because you might say, this is true almost none of the time for me. I really think I'm doing a pretty good job. I get enough sleep. I eat healthy. I exercise. I surround myself with positive people. So I really don't have to be thinking about making changes. Or maybe this is, a, you know, a number three. This is true of me most of the time. I really think that there are some things I've been told that I need to cut down on refined sugar, caffeine, alcohol, whatever it might be. 
So again, looking at where are you with that thought today. The way I take care of my body expresses the way I feel about myself. That's a biggie. Um, if you uh, kind of prescribe to the thinking of you are what you eat, you are you know, what you think about yourself, and I really do uh, take stock in that. Um, I know that when I care for myself well, I really try to make sure that I'm doing stress reduction things. I get all of my healthy meals in, I get my water in, and because that's kind of how I feel. When I'm feeling uh, maybe down or depressed, I might not be more in as inclined to take care of myself. Again, no right or wrong, no judgment there, but this is just, wow, you know, for you to take a look at. When I look in the mirror, I feel comfortable with my physical appearance. How many of us can answer yes? You know, this is true of me most of the time. And if you're not comfortable with that, um, again, no judgment, but what do I need to do to be comfortable with who I am when I look at myself every day? Because I think that's a big part of our self-esteem and moving us forward. Um, number four, moving along on slide seven here, I like to give and get hugs. And that's a personal thing. You know, you might be a touchy-feely kind of person, but again, maybe it's a message of, hmm, I've been kind of closing people out of my life. Uh, I have a 16-year-old daughter, soon to be 17, and uh, we talked about this recently, uh, about showing affection and emotion and whether or not she likes it and if she does if her friends aren't around and those kinds of things. Um, so, you know, just checking in with yourself. Am I getting enough love, physical attention, hugs, that kind of thing? Exercise. Is it a priority in your life? It might not be something that you love and dig, but um, whether or not you really like going to the gym, if you do the bicep curls, you will get stronger. <laughs> um, and uh, again, some of exercise is, if it's not your firstborn love, it might be something that you have to do what I call the fake it till you make it principle, which is going through the motions even though you're really not in love with it because you know that when you're done or the outcome will produce a result that does help you feel better. Um, Moving on, my diet consists mainly of fast foods. This is a tough one. Uh, our world and our culture is really set up to be very um, quick, on the go, um, you know, in this moment. And sadly, I think that you know, when Arby's or any one of the fast food chains, I'm not picking on anyone in particular, you know, advertises five sandwiches for five bucks. Um, that's you're hard pressed not to feed a family on a fixed income going that route versus the organic whole foods market, which you know up front seems like a bigger cost. So again, no judgment there, but just kind of checking in. Wow, you know what? I sort of am noticing that I go through the drive-through seven times a week. I regularly get enough sleep. Um, I usually find that clients who come to me either are getting nowhere near enough sleep or sleep might be a defense mechanism and a piece of our symptoms and depression. So again, looking at that. Uh, moving along, when something ails me, I tend to want to treat the symptoms rather than look for the cause. Hmm, I'm in pain, I wanna take a pain pill. And that might be appropriate, but maybe I need to look at what's the cause of the pain? Um, emotional and or physical. I've strained something, maybe I just need to rest. I'm motivated to take better care of myself in all respects. And I frequently do not take care of my physical and emotional needs. So again, just kind of a quick 10 question little self check quiz as you're moving along through the, the uh, program, you know, answering those questions and then spend some time with it, you know, in your own private time. Hmm, am I feeling the best and most optimal that I believe that I could feel? And if I'm not, what are some things that I might need to do to change that. And so how do we go about doing that? You know, each day we can analyze, choose, change, and then thrive based on the the, the questions and, and answers that we're, we're looking at for ourselves. Are you feeling a high level of wellness today? Are you feeling an optimum sense of health? Or do you feel an absence of well-being, an absence of joy in living? And if so, you know, really starting to peel back the layers of the onion and look at what might be causing that and what's going on in my life. Health is not merely the absence of disease or dis-ease. Um, I had, I believe Debbie had mentioned, you know, some of my work, I, I still work as a nurse practitioner and I, I do um, some work in a home care practice. And I have, 
I have to say I, I receive so many rich, rich blessings from the patients that I see. I think I get back far more from my patients than I have ever given. And I had the real privilege of, of seeing a, a man last week. He was 65 years old. To look at him, he looked great. Um, met me at the door, welcomed, welcomed me in, had a great sense of humor. He's 65 years young and he's dying of terminal cancer. He shared his story that he's a Vietnam veteran. He was exposed to Agent Orange and is now has metastatic cancer. And yet he described his life as very healthy, you know, really sucking the juice out of the berry of every opportunity that he has placed in front of him. And he really did not see himself as ill or unwell. So, you know, kind of looking at, am I really defining myself by a diagnosis, a symptom? Because if we are, that might be a health limiting belief that we're holding. And health is not merely the absence of disease, nor is it um, you know, negatively affected just because we have a diagnosis of a particular disease. So my central message always is that you and I and every one of us are worth every positive action that you take for your health. And you may feel like you are looking at a complete uphill st step of stairs where, wow, I've been told that I have bipolar. I've been put on a medicine that makes me a little bit insulin resistant. And now I'm borderline diabetic. I've gained 10 pounds since I've been put on this medicine. I have no energy. I really don't have any motivation. I don't even know where to start. And the, you know, the idea behind this slide is one positive thing absolutely does make a difference. So eating breakfast every day, moving, calling a friend when you know that you're feeling down and you need a little bit of support. Whatever it is in your particular life, um, it's worth it. And so I'm going to continue to kind of uh, bring that message back around that wellness is a choice. It's really a way of life. It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It's, again, those every single moment by moment, meal by meal, attitude by attitude kind of choices that we make every single day. I think for me, wellness is an understanding that everything we do and feel has an impact on our overall health. And first and foremost, I think that wellness is a, is a place where we um, hopefully come to a, a loving acceptance of ourselves, even on our down, sad, depressed days, on our maybe our racing manic days, on our, you know what, everything seems pretty stable and, and going well kind of days. Um, because we will have them. Every, you know, all of us will have days like that. So looking at what kind of choices can I make day by day that will help to improve my health and wellness. All right, and this is, goes back to the, the slide that I talked about looking at undoing, unlearning, and maybe challenging some of the health lim limiting beliefs that we might hold about our past, our current, where we're at right now. So why is this important? Um, you know, how does what we think about affect our health and wellness? I w you know, will share with you that Back about a year ago, I was really not feeling well physically, and when you're in pain, either physical pain or emotional pain, it's very um, tricky and easy to focus on the pain, is it not? And I was focusing on, you know, I have this belly pain and I'm throwing up all my meals still, and it seemed like that's all I kept focusing on. Now, what do you do if you have a two-year-old child and you tell them, do not take the cookies out of the cookie jar. What are they going to focus on? <laughs> exactly what you told them not to focus on. And, that, and that's all they're going to want is, is more cookies. So the idea here is that what you focus on, what you think about, you get more of. And I was focusing really on my pain and that I just didn't feel well. And I really had an aha moment where I actually went to a, the chiropractor and I was laying there on the nice little water massage table and he has this lovely little uh, television in the ceiling, a teleprompt, and it, it said that, you know, what you focus on you get more of. If you're focusing on the pain, all you're going to think about, feel is the pain. And this, please hear me, um, I always want to respect our emotional and physical pain and not minimize that in any way, shape, or form by saying, oh, you know, your, your depression will just go away if you don't think about it. That's clearly not my message, but in the midst of, and even especially when we're feeling those symptoms, I think that we almost have to force ourselves um, to do all of these 
healthy wellness kinds of activities because we know that we're going to have negative days. So for me in particular, I had to say, okay, so my belly hurts today, but here's the other blessings and things I have in my life. I have you know, food on my table. I have, and, and I have to start at that level. So that is hopefully a little nugget of some kind of truth that will help um, someone in my listening audience to move along. As I started to pay less attention and really feeling very stuck on my pain and noticing other things and maybe trying to be sensitive to other people and realizing, wow, other people might have it worse off than me. That helped me in particular. And sure enough, I started incorporating some of the things that I had dropped off in my life. And admittedly, um, spiritual practice and prayer. I think I was so uncomfortable and angry and negative that I had stopped doing some of the things that I knew were always something that was helpful for me. So health challenging beliefs. They can rob us of our energy. Um, I'm depressed and my medicine made me gain weight. Yeah, that's a reality. Some of us will face that. I don't have energy to exercise. I can't afford to eat a healthy diet. That's a, that's a reality. Healthy food, sadly, is a lot more costly than um, the prepackaged stuff. I'm alone. It's easier to stay home and not try. I don't have any choice in things. How many of you, again, I'm not looking for a show of hands, um, but have we ever uttered some of these sentences? And if we have, again, no judgment, but looking at, hmm, that, that thought system, or even just saying those words out loud, might be limiting my health in some way or fashion. Maybe I need to be willing to at least understand it a little bit differently, um, adopt a new way of thinking about it. Uh, many, many mornings, we're not going to have enough energy to exercise. I, I practice the do it for 10 minutes, and then if you still don't, you know, are feeling awful, then you can quit uh, principle, and I've never quit. So many times, you know, whatever the task is uh, at, at hand, um, getting out of bed, you know, making breakfast for your family, for your children. I really don't have the energy to do this, but, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it my 10-minute uh, rule. And chances are, once you get started into it, once you get on that treadmill and start walking, once you start, you know, boiling the water for your oatmeal or whatever it is that you do, your, your morning, you know, routine, um, you will find the momentum to kind of continue to carry you through that. Again, further along that negative trap of staying stuck in those negative feelings, this is kind of a, a, a wheel of, I know that for myself, um, some of these things were coming up, um, you know, loud and, and regularly when I was just looking at the things that I perceived to be um, my struggles. And it can keep us there and disempower us and create more unpleasant feelings and, and kind of worsen our depression and demotivate us. So again, not at all to um, disregard these very real physical and emotional symptoms that we have, but almost as a place of, okay, I'm respecting and owning that this is where I'm at. How can I um, be more well in spite of this? And sometimes it's just an attitudinal shift. Am I going to look at my glasses half empty or am I going to try and see, you know what, I've got at least half of it full and I'm going to work on that. Uh, and so why is it so important? Because there is a significant link to our general health and global health um, outcomes, mental illness and heart disease, mental illness and diabetes, obesity, our immune systems, our social and relational health relationships, our personal responsibility to take care of ourselves and the people you know, that, we, that are in our lives, our financial wellness. All of these things are absolutely impacted in the presence of mental illness significantly more so than someone without a diagnosis of mental illness. Someone with a diagnosis of bipolar and or schizophrenia has a 30% increased risk than the general population for um, developing heart disease. 30 to 40% increased risk for diabetes and obesity, immune related problems. And we know when we're escalating or cycling into depressive kinds of symptoms, um, oftentimes our social and relational, personal, financial relationships can um, take a hit from that. So when, when we are at risk for relapsing with depression, no energy, 
we tend to not make the healthiest choices then, which affects our blood sugar. Um, kind of a big focus here on diabetes because a lot of the medicines that are, are utilized to treat uh, bipolar absolutely cause some insulin resistance, which means that the insulin that kind of uh, filters around in our system to bring our, to, to utilize the sugary um, carbohydrates that we take into our system, um, it, it, it's kind of a puzzle piece that doesn't fit and it leaves all of that, um, the sugary fuel out into the blood vessels, which will increase our risk for uh, increased uh, glucose readings, diabetes risk, those kinds of things. So um, I, you know, I'm paying just a, a bit more attention to diabetes as a disease state because there is a significant link with um, the diagnosis of, of bipolar and increasing rates of, of the di diabetes. So again, the message of moving, choosing healthy foods, those kinds of things is especially important. And then you need to look at, you know, what is my personal diet? What is my family history? The significance of this slide: these are the morbidity rates or death rates of heart disease, lung disease, diabetes and obesity, cancer and infections, over here on the nice colored uh, left side of the wheel. On the right side, the yellow reflects death rates from depression, anxiety, bipolar, childhood disorders. So that's significant. And I don't know that you know most of the public really captures that. You know, we still have stigma over here. This is what's getting all the funding and research dollars to treat heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, obesity. We're at increased risk for it over here with a diagnosis of bipolar uh, and, and other mental illness. So um, again, my message is that even in the setting of uh, a mental health issue, um, I'm going to hopefully try and help you find ways to maximize your health to decrease all of those risks. And we're going to do it one choice at a time. Are we going to fall down? Absolutely. We're going to take one step forward, two steps back. Ah, uh, you know what? I did have three Krispy Kreme donuts this morning or whatever it might be. I just did not get out of bed and exercise. I'm really kind of stuck in that negativity. Um, I know that I'm starting to cycle. I need to phone you know, friends and people that, that I care about. I wasn't able to do that today. Next time, I think I might try that a little sooner. Whatever it might be in you, you and my own personal life, that's what we, what we need to do. So how do we stay focused on recovery? Um, again, I use this principle. I call it the fake it till you make it principle. And there's nothing dishonest about that. It is saying, okay, I don't feel like getting out of bed and exercising today, but my doctor told me I need to. I know that my risks for other comorbid diseases are elevated um, with my particular health state. Um, I'm going to do it even though I don't feel like it. How many of you have a local uh, mental health drop-in center or uh, you know, your, your place of employment, whatever it is that you know that you get some positive reinforcement, purpose, uh, it's your work order day, whatever it might be, you need to do those things even when you don't feel like it. That's the fake it till you make a principle. Um, do it especially, do it when you don't feel like it, do it especially when you don't feel like it, do it because it's absolutely a matter of your very quality and essence of life. And I do believe that. Again, I, I'm not trying to simplify the message as it's, that it's easy because I don't believe that it is. Some days it's much harder than other days, but I think that it's necessary and I have always found that once I do commit to it and put that one foot forward, even if I falter and stumble back, um, I still feel like I'm, I'm moving forward. So what we think we are, I believe it was Henry Ford who said, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. So if we kind of look at that, you know, if you walk into a situation and you are on fire, you're feeling positive, you are owning it, you, you know what, I so have this. I'm going to nail this interview. I feel so positive about it. I have prepared. I've done all of my homework. I've done everything I could. I feel great about it. Whether or not you get you know, the job, you already have won because of your attitude. But let's flip that around. Whether or not you get the job, you walk in, you know what, I don't feel qualified, uh, I, uh, you know, there's a hundred applicants out there, I probably am not going to get it, I don't think that I can do this, I'm nervous, oh, why would they pick me anyhow? You were already dead in the water before you even, you know, walk into the, the office and, and introduce yourself to the person. You're emanating negative energy. So again, fake it till you make it. What you think you kind of really determines what you believe about yourself. What you believe about yourself determines how you feel. Um, you know, and, and try to let that bubble down into your own life. You know, when you feel 
strong, confident, in control of things, that you are well prepared? Don't you feel um, you know, emotionally a bit more positive about yourself? When you feel good about that, you, you kind of show that. And the actions and, and things you choose come from that. And the, you know, the line on the bottom here, you can't live a positive life with a negative mind. I, I firmly uh, agree and believe, with, believe that and, and have seen it in my own life when I was competing uh, and was getting ready to step on stage or you know, go to the gym and lift a particular weight. I would tell myself, I so am going to nail this set. I know I'm getting five reps. And generally I did. And if I didn't get the, the actual number, at least I felt better about myself positively in that I had told myself those positive messages instead of telling myself the negative stuff because the negative stuff is what drags us down. So again, not a new message. I think every one of us has heard this. Never, never, never give up. We are worth far more than that. Just sitting where you are right now, December 10th, at whatever time it is here in the afternoon, you have survived much to be you know, sitting and listening to this webinar. You're stronger than your circumstances. I tell my clients that all the time. Um, our greatest glory is not in never failing, but in rising up every time we fail. And I guess the only thing that I would challenge Sir Ralph Waldo Emerson on is that I don't know that if we fall down that it's a failure. I kind of look at it as a lesson. So, you know, and if you happen to be a great Rocky fan, you know, it's not how many times you, you, or how hard you get hit, but it's, you know, how many times you get up after getting hit. Fall down seven times, stand up eight. So that's a, a nice principle to, uh, you know, utilize as a mantra in your life. Ah, okay. Seven bad days. Eighth one's got to be better. How do we do that? How do we start the process of health changing practices in our lives? I always find it helpful when I want to incorporate something new or when I was getting ready to um, compete in, in a, my next competition, I would start talking. I would tell people, hey, you know what? I'm going to do that show in November. Well, then you sort of are held accountable, aren't you? <laughs> Put it out there. Tell your friends, you know what? I'm going to start incorporating some healthier things. I'm going to start exercising. I'm going to stop smoking. So you're putting it out there for the, your friends, the universe, and yourself to hold yourself accountable for it. Surround yourself with positive, influential people that will influence you and motivate you and help engage you to make those changes. So it's small steps. Talk about it. Think about it. Surround yourself with positive, influential people that will help you to connect and make those changes. So refer back to that. Print out that slide and put it on your refrigerator if you need to. And I have to tell you, I do that. I, I have these positive self-esteem, self-messages all over my house. <laughs> All right, so we're going to look at our physical self, the importance of exercise, nutrition, self-care, you know, brushing our teeth, getting our eyes examined, maintaining a healthy body weight, blood pressure, getting enough sleep, emotional selves, you know, how well are we doing at managing stress, at regulating our emotions, at maintaining a positive attitude. That's not, that's not always easy. At listening and just becoming aware at these self-nurturing practices. If you are um, maybe extending yourself too much this time of year, the holidays, people are asking you, hey, can you bake seven dozen cookies? Oh my word, in my lifetime. Um, they don't ask me to do that. <laughs> they ask me to do public speaking. Nobody usually asks me to cook and bake. Um, but maybe the answer is, ah, you know what? I would love to be able to do that for you, but I'm, I'm just overextended right now. Thank you so much for thinking of me. A self-nurturing practice is learning how to say no. Our nutritional self, we're going to look at food as medicine or what I like to call farm a C. Looking at superfoods, foods that absolutely have a link research-wise to help prevent depression. And really looking at avoiding depression triggers, which come in the form of certain foods can actually um, kind of uh, enhance our um, depressive symptoms and enhance being a negative thing there. And our spiritual selves. What is our connection to our self when we are feeling well emotionally? When we are cycling into depression or mania? You know, are we staying connected to others? Um, connection to a higher power, however you define that. So that's kind of what we're looking at. All right. Physical self. Exercise. Again, I think that it is important to do some kind of movement daily. And what 
you need to determine what is it that moves you. If I encouraged everyone in, who's attending this webinar to start running, run three times a week, five miles. If you hate to run or, or don't have enough money to buy a, a nice pair of running shoes, which you need, and or you live in um, chilly Pennsylvania, 22 degrees, and you don't have warm, you know, enough uh, appropriate weather to go out running, or you just there's nothing about running that, that thrills you. You're not going to be um, you know, effective at that. But I've seen women that can spend hours long in their garden or that go to like line dancing and those kinds of things. Find an activity that inspires you and helps you to stay active and move. I played basketball in high school 25 years ago. Uh, and I, when I go to the Y to do my cardio, when I get off the bike, I happen to wander into the, ba the, the gym one day, and there's a the basket over there filled with basketballs. And I picked up the basketball, I had my iPod, iPod on, and I just started shooting baskets. Now, mind you, I had to start in the about one foot range <laughs> to hit the basket any longer. But I found that I sat there and played my little game of horse by myself, and I felt so emotionally high and wonderful and all of those exercise endorphins. And it really didn't, I really wasn't working hard, but I hadn't played basketball in 25 years and I forgot how much I loved it. And so now whenever I go to the Y and do my cardio, I run down to the gym and I just shoot around for 10, 15 minutes, whatever you know, the amount of time I have on that particular day. And that inspires me, uh, lifts my mood on any given day. Find what works for you. It has to be something that you enjoy doing, or you're probably not going to stick with it. Um, you know, looking at a an, a an exercise pyramid, if you will, kind of like our healthy food pyramid. Um, you know, physical activity, uh, walking, taking some kind of class, take a karate class, take a CrossFit step box, whatever it might be. Um, include stretching and yoga. Again, gardening, shopping, golf. There can be some um, cardiovascular shopping. I've seen these people on Black Friday. I've not been one of them, <laughs> but I do believe that might be a cardiovascular event. Um, limit the sedentary kinds of things that keeps us sitting down. The more you move, the more energy it creates. Um, that absolutely is one of the laws of physics, that the more you move, the more um, you want to continue to move, and the more you, you know, a body at rest tends to stay at rest, a body in motion tends to stay in motion. So physical health looking at our nutrition. Are you promoting a sluggish metabolism? How do we do that? One of the biggest robbers of our metabolism, revving fire engine um, ability to burn fat is uh, probably the most common thing I see when clients come to me to, to the gym for weight loss and, and fitness kinds of things is they skip breakfast, they eat one meal a day, and they don't understand why they're gaining weight and have no energy. And it's kind of the equivalent, I look at our body and its ability to really effectively use the food and fuel, kind of like starting a fire. Would you think to open the fireplace and put one huge log, i.e. one meal, in with your little match and try to get it to set on fire and burn hot for you all day long? No, you would not, would you? So think of your nutrition, your energy, your metabolism as starting a campfire. You start with you know several pieces of rolled up newspaper and then several small pieces of really thin kindling wood and then you get that going and then you put a, a you know a log on and then every couple of hours you add uh, you know more wood to it. That's really how probably the simplest and most effective way for weight loss, maintaining a healthy um, you know BMI and and weight and for maximizing your energy. Think of your food as fuel energy, putting gas in your tank. Are you maximizing your energy by you know, regularly having some small, frequent meals of good quality food? Or are you eat, trying to you know, run your car engine on one log and at the end of the day you have just run your tank down to nothing? So uh, that's a helpful metaphor for me. Hopefully it will do uh, the same for you. Are you supporting your total health by you know, choosing um, heart disease preventing kinds of foods? Or is it more fast food, trans fats, those kinds of things? So looking at how can you maximize your efforts in the nutrition arena? Do you eat when you're not hungry? I call this mindless grazing. Um, you are now addicted to Duck Dynasty and you get your bag of chips or Doritos or whatever it is and before you know it you watch the whole, I don't, I've never watched it, I, I hear it's a big thing. You watch the whole segment and gone through a bag of chips and you think, oh my word, what happened? What, uh, what happened here? How did I do that? Do you eat too quickly? 
You eat less than 30 grams of fiber a day. These are the things that are recommended more than 35 grams, uh, 30 grams of fiber a day. Kind of slowly savoring. Taste your food. Do you eat fewer than five servings of fruits or vegetables a day? Keeping in mind that a serving is about a half a cup. So, you know, we may, be, we may, may get to that. Do you eat breakfast every single day? You really need to. And the, the most common complaint I hear there is, but I'm not hungry. I know you're not hungry because you, you've tanked your metabolism into the basement because you're trying to subsist on uh, a pot of coffee in the morning and one meal later. You have no energy. You're not going to be hungry. I promise you, and I do not make promises lightly. Start eating breakfast every day, and within about four weeks, you will be hungry in the morning for breakfast. You, you will wake up in the middle of the night thinking about breakfast, and you may lose a few pounds. You may have more energy. So those are some metabolism traps when you eat when you're not hungry, eating too quickly, not eating the right foods, skipping breakfast has to be the single biggest one, binge eating, eating less than four meals a day. Um, I eat every two hours from the time I wake up in the morning until the time I go to bed, kind of like a breastfed baby. <laughs> um, I maintain an extra lean frame and I generally speaking have uh, plenty of energy to get me through my day as, as long as I keep moving. Um, so again, thinking with that small frequent meals and fueling your engine with good quality fuel will help you to have more energy. I promise you it will. Drinking enough water, staying hydrated. And this is especially important, um, especially given some of the medications that we're on. Some are metabolized by, um, uh, well, all meds are metabolized either by your kidney or your liver. Um, some are, are um, fat soluble. And so you really need to stay well hydrated. Um, do you eat more processed foods than whole grains and whole foods? Are you getting enough protein in your diet? Most American diets consist of, if I had a show of hands, it would be fats and carbohydrates. Um, is your diet excess in sugar and salt? So kind of looking at if you answer yes to any of these questions, again, it's not a place of, oh my word, I have failed the test. I'm such a loser. That's not at all it. It's looking at, hmm, you know what? I really don't think I'm getting enough protein. What is protein? It's something that has parents. <laughs> it means it's an animal protein. Um, lean chicken, turkey, beef, eggs, tofu, if you do soy, um, that is what a protein is. Um, protein powder, whey powder. Um, I have a, a lot of food allergies to my celiac disease, so I use a, a really clean egg white protein powder. Um, so, you know, whatever you're looking at, making sure you're getting enough protein, you need that for muscle building, for brain metabolism, all of those kinds of things. And to not slow your metabolic engine down. All right, so again, kind of like a, another little wellness inventory, are you getting exercise a few times a week? Are you getting those essential omega-3 fatty acids in, um, eating fatty fish? Okay, what do I do if I really don't like salmon or tuna or some of these things that they say I know I should be having? Um, there's some omega-3 supplements that you can get probably at anywhere as cheap as at Walmart, Walgreens. Limiting red meat, um, you know, what's your caffeine? Um, I will have to say caffeine to me is the elixir of the gods. <laughs> so I do allow myself two cups in the morning. Um, are you drinking two cups or two pots? So looking at everything in our life, are we, you know, using and utilizing it to moderation and to a place that feels like a balance? Or is it something that maybe I'm, I'm in, in, in excess of and maybe I need to um, just look at that a little bit closer? Um, strength conditioning. All of these things will help promote our metabolism, help and, and beyond weight management, a healthy metabolism will help you to feel like you have more energy. And that's probably one of the, the most common reports that I get from um, clients anywhere is that I don't have any energy and when my depression cycles, it's even worse. Um, just some other personal self-care kinds of things. You are hard pressed in this day uh, and age to have great um, insurance, whether it's Obamacare or otherwise, and to have somebody covering your dental plan. So if you don't have dental care, you know, what can you do that's in your control? Brush your teeth, floss your teeth. Um, again, sounds like simple, not research-based uh, evidence kind of thing, but something that's an important piece of your self-care. Avoiding smoking, avoiding drugs and alcohol, um, you know, looking at, hmm, I'm noticing that around the holidays, this is a really tough time for me. 
I spend more time alone, I've lost family members, you know, whatever it might be, I notice that my three drinks a week are now five or six or more. If that is where you're at, um, you know, again, it might be a place of personal self-care, checking in that you have to look at. What am I numbing myself? What am I filling myself up with that I might really actually just need to look at that a little bit closer um, from a, you know, sitting with my emotion standpoint. Now, in December here in Pennsylvania, I'm not thinking about sunscreen because I don't see the sunshine so much, but um, it still is out there using sunscreen. Again, this is just personal self-care. And the reason this sounds so basic, and I absolutely am not trying to insult anyone's intelligence, but my belief is that on any given day when we are having um, a recurrence of our symptoms and we're feeling depressed and not motivated or racing and manic, what is it in my life, in my ability to take better care of myself that is in my control? You know what? Brushing my teeth, flossing my teeth, putting on my sunscreen. Um, wearing my seatbelt, washing my hands, getting my flu shot. It might sound silly and simple, but on a day when I need some validation that, you know what, I'm doing everything I can to take care of myself physically and emotionally, that matters to me. And it does count and it does add up. And sometimes you put that on your list. You know what, I got out of bed today. I ate breakfast. I walked on the treadmill for 10 minutes. I did put on my moisturizing anti-aging uh, cream with sunscreen in it. <laughs> I bathe in the stuff. But, um, you know, what am I doing to take as uh, take care of myself as well and as good as I can? Sleep. This is a tough animal. Some of the meds we take affect our sleep, either to the detriment or to the excess. Um, some of, you know, you may be menopausal, you may be angry, you may be addicted, you may have any number of things that can affect your sleep. You may have that um, little anxious wheel of thoughts that won't shut themselves off and when you lay flat and horizontal at night, it's like someone turned the light on it and said, okay, now's the time where I'm going to spin around on this little wheel and just think, 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 think and rob you of your sleep. So maybe journaling, maybe keeping you know a bedside journal and writing down the things that are um, weighing heavy on your mind, that are making you feel anxious, that are robbing you a bit of your sleep, that are making you feel run down. So looking at your physical health, your sleep, and this is the place where we just take a deep breath, <sighs> mindfully checking in. All right, I'm going to move quickly through the nutrition because, again, I don't think it's a, a new message. But really looking at, um, am I choosing the healthiest options that I can for myself? The purpose of this slide, number 39 here, is really to say, incorporate your kids in it. Uh, it's a whole family lifestyle affair. You don't, there, I don't believe that there really are such things as kid foods. Um, chicken nuggets and tater tots and french fries are, really aren't healthy for anybody. Um, you can feed your, ch your children chicken and green beans and a healthy salad. My daughter has grown up on healthy food and... Um, I don't know that she really knows the difference. The more times you can choose real foods versus packaged foods in your life, I think is helpful. And how do I do that when I'm on a fixed income? How do I do that when the only food that I have access to is a free lunch at the drop-in center? And that's a very real question that I get a lot from participants. And so, um, you know, the next slide kind of addresses a lot of that and looking at portion control. If I, the only meal I get is a hot meal at my mental health drop-in center each uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday afternoon or whatever it might be for you and the idea is that we're going to give you food that will fill you up, then you know, portion control. Ask if you have a take-home container and you can take the rest of it home for your next meal. Um, plan your grocery trips, your rides if you don't have a ride, you know, a transportation yourself. Jump in with someone else. Cut, clip coupons. Um, eliminate money that you spend on empty calories like soda, gum, alcohol, those kinds of things. And, you know, maybe buying a bag, a, a box of um, oatmeal will get you far further along the line uh, than, you know, a, a box of cereal, which, which is packaged. The idea here is looking at portion control. <sighs> And this slide is, is just in case you have really never really looked at, you know, how do I read a label? How do I know what food is the right food or a healthy food for me? Um, you know, looking at total calories and paying special attention to a serving size. 
how many of you actually measure out, you know, a half a cup of cereal? Or do you just pour, you know, the whole bowl and you realize, oh my word, I have six servings of that, which multiply your carbohydrates. The idea here is that you want less than 30% of the total calories to come from fat. You'd like not to have um, the saturated fat uh, rung lit up there. You want to have more emphasis on your vitamins and minerals, um, good fibers, low sugar, that kind of thing. I find that a lot of people have not really read labels. Uh, this slide is all about um, foods that will help you prevent depression. And there absolutely is a statistically significant research correlation with um, folks who have depressive illnesses tend to have low serum folate and low vitamin B12. And I'm going to talk about the foods that are um, helpful in preventing and really um, maximizing your uh, potential to have an improved mood. Certainly whole grains. And again, this slide really um, says individuals with depressive disorders and alcoholism have significantly low serum folate and vitamin B12 and low omega-3 fatty acids. And I have heard unequivocally from patients that I have cared for that when they started incorporating omega-3s into their diet, they did notice an improvement in their depressive symptoms. So these foods here are rich in folate and B12, multi and whole grains, eggs, low-fat dairy, lean chicken, whey protein. This column over here is your omega-3, salmon, flaxseed, chia seeds, nuts. And these are just healthy superfoods, antioxidant berries, anything that is green and leafy is good for you. I mentioned honey, not that it's a, uh, it, it qualifies as a superfood, but as uh, a form of a natural, unrefined sweetener versus just simple white sugar sweet potatoes. So those are some dietary must-haves that absolutely can be depression preventing. Now, this is our quick, fun tour through the grocery store. I love to go grocery shopping. The perimeter of the grocery store, you probably have heard this before, but this is where you want to hang out. Looks very pretty too, doesn't it? <laughs> this person gets a, uh, an A plus in um, OCD organizing and marketing They're very well. This is actually a, uh, a real picture of a deer that got caught in a uh, grocery store. Where do you think he went to? The produce, the greens. Did not find him hanging out in the bulk candy aisle, did we? This is uh, especially colorful for this time of year at Christmas. Avoid red. Oh, red dye number what? You're going to get a lot of artificial color, flavor, sweeteners in there. And it's going to wreak havoc on your blood sugar, wreak havoc on your propensity for diabetes. And this slide is all about possible drug interactions. Some of the prescribed meds um, that you might be taking, a tricyclic antidepressant or an MAOI inhibitor, um, anything linked with deli meats, aged meats, cured meats, can have a significant and profound drug food interaction. And again, right here in this slide, you're paying for packaged meat. You'd be economically better off to buy a whole roast chicken or turkey roast it in your, throw it in a crock pot. I use my crock pot all the time for my daughter uh, for meals. And you'll get several days worth of good quality protein without all of these um, toxic uh, nitrates and sodium and other things. Ooh, very colorful. Um, but again, you're paying for packaging. If, you, if we went one aisle over, we would find the big box of Quaker um, oatmeal. You would get for under $2 an entire jug of uh, unrefined oats that you can have breakfast for every single day without all of uh, the payment in packaging. And this slide looks at, I know our kids love this, but I promise you they will eat what you put in front of them if you put it, keep putting it in front of them day after day. 40 to 56% of these, these uh, cereals are their main ingredient is sugar. That's a lot to be you know, shoveling in every morning. This slide just kind of is a one quick look at one Big Mac, 540 calories. 260 come from fat, um, 30, 29 fat grams, and 10 of those are saturated. You get half of your day's sodium uh, milligrams in one Big Mac if you're following a low sodium diet. So again, not to beat us up with, oh, I've had six Big Macs already and it's only Tuesday this week. Um, truth in advertising. When I teach um, my content on eating disorders, I usually assign my nursing students to um, Start looking at advertising 
and how often the message we get from magazine articles, food, uh, jingles on the, the radio or, or television that tell us something about a food other than its nutritional value. Do you really believe that if you eat an Arby's roast beef sandwich that your mood is going to improve? It's going to put you in a good mood. It might satiate you and make you feel less hungry, but look at how we're being deceived. That's the purpose of that slide. And I'll, I'll leave you to, to read this cartoon. It's kind of a funny one. Um, acrylamide chips, zero nutrition puffs. <laughs> um, so food and mood, it really is a two-way um, street and we need to be looking at the, two, the foods that we choose absolutely have an impact on my overall health, emotional and physical. <sighs> Making sure that you're staying well hydrated. That's important. Our emotional health, how are we doing? Uh, I'm going to be able to wrap up here in about five minutes and then I will um, entertain time for questions and answers if you have any for me. Um, again, not new information, but taking care of our stressors. Stress is a physical and emotional response to whatever situation is, is in front of us. How we manage that in large part can be looking, can be related to how we look at it. Um, being able to change our, our emotional response. Do I typically blow up and then come back and apologize? Maybe I need to let go of things that are out of my control. Um, if my life is really out of balance, and I'm speaking for myself personally, I'm working too much, um, I tend to not manage my stress as well. So that might be when I need to reach out to one of my friends, um, take a deep breath, walk away from the situation, pull back, learn to say no more. Emotion regulation, what does this mean? It's really the nuts and bolts of how we sit with or how we deal with whatever distressing emotion is in front of us. And, um, and, and that's what we do. You know what, you're faced with um, bad news, uh, diagnosis, you're feeling unwell physically or emotionally. And really, you know, part of that is just owning it. You know what, today is not a great day. Um, I'm sad today. And sometimes I think just acknowledging that to ourselves is the first step in helping us get through it. So we sit with it, we acknowledge it. We don't run away from it. We don't try to drink it away, drug it away, sex it away, you know, sleep it away, not look at it. We sit with it. That's emotion regulation. And then really taking time every day for you. If any of you are my age or older and have flown on an airplane in the, in, uh, the recent decade or so, remember the, uh, the, everything's on a DVD now so they don't do this any longer, but um, the message used to be, in the event of a crash, your oxygen tubing will pop down out of the ceiling. And what do they tell you to do? Do they tell you, oh my word, you need to multitask and go take care of everybody and you need to you know, take the little children to the bathroom first because you haven't forbid the plane would go down and they'd pee their pants. No, 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 take a deep breath. They say, put your own oxygen mask on first so that then you can help the other people around you. And that really is a, a literal and figurative um, look at, ah, I have to be able to take care of myself before I can do anything else effective in my life. Looking at your spiritual health, how do you define spirituality? It's the connection to, again, your definition of the divine, your most healthy and self-actualized health. Um, spiritual connection for me is when I am well connected to myself, remembering my daily mindful prayer, uh, journaling, kindness kinds of practices, going to mass, whatever it might be for you, and breathing. Not forgetting to take a deep breath. Not forgetting that serenity prayer. You know, what are the things in my life that I can change? Give me, show me the courage to change the things that I can. And the knowledge, you know, and I thank you for being here with this webinar. Hopefully that you're learning something of, huh, okay, that's something I can change, that's something I can't. And I think ultimately our must-haves for our health and wellness is a belief of hope and respect for ourselves, reclaiming one's life, feeling connected, understanding and moving from stigma and secrecy to transparency that, you know what, yeah, here I am with bipolar. I'm living well with it and I have a belief in my recovery. So be a standout in your own great health story. Um, this slide reminds me of, what if I feel very unhealthy? There's a poem from Rumi that says, the cracked and broken places are where the light comes in. So you may feel cracked and broken and depressed and not so healthy, but that's the place where you can infuse healing and wellness and continue to make those healthy choices. One step at a time, taking a deep breath, 
and really owning, you know, I'm responsible for the growth and maintenance of mindfulness in my own life. Every day I have an opportunity and may I live with mindful compassion for myself. Um, kind of a little thank you prayer there. So um, that wraps things up. I hope I've, I, I can talk for hours. <laughs> I hope that um, this has been uh, of some kind of, of benefit to you. Thank you for your attention, all of those who, who are out there listening. And I believe my um, organizer, Debbie, is going to open up for some question and answer that I would love to entertain uh, from anyone now. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you very much, Susan. Mm -hmm. First question. Yes. I have bipolar 2 that has been out of control since I lost 80 pounds. Would the toxins released mm. from the fat cells ca cause this? My diet changed 180 degrees from processed American food to totally fresh Portuguese vegetarian and fish. Okay. First off, I commend you on making those dietary changes. Those are not easy. And excellent job on losing the 80 pounds. I, let me, can I clarify what your question is? It, one more time. It, are you asking me that I'm now I'm having really wild symptoms all over the place, and is it because of my weight loss? Am I hearing yeah. you correctly? Yes, correct. A, I would say weight loss and the dietary changes in and of themselves absolutely are not causing a, a rapid cycling and shift in your mood, but I would say that if you were prescribed meds, you know, 80 pounds ago, they absolutely can be being metabolized very differently in your body now that you are 80 pounds lighter, and that may be contributing to, um, you may be becoming toxic in some of your med levels, and, and, you know, electrolytes, and there's a lot of play, uh, specifically if you're on lithium or any of the mood stabilizers, absolutely those can be impacted by that sudden and, and big of a weight loss. Doesn't mean that the drug itself is toxic for you or that you should necessarily not be taking it, but um, I would absolutely be checking in with who's ever prescribing for you and um, maybe a dose change, maybe a medication change. Maybe you don't need, um, again, without having further knowledge of that, I would say um, that maybe your meds absolutely need um, a, a reevaluation inventory there. But just the weight loss alone and the healthy foods absolutely are positive things for you. I commend you on those. In and of itself, that can, does not um, make you cycle. But uh, you know, metabolically, you may be processing things a little bit differently, and that might need looked at. You also may have some thyroid issues with that sudden of, of weight change that I would say a comprehensive medical exam uh, would be in order if you haven't already. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Next question. Is there a real link between coffee and depression? Now, it's, I always question that because I, I, have my, I work on a lot of inpatient mental health units and they always serve decaf coffee. And there is nothing in the literature that um, will say that having caffeine intake increases your depressive symptoms. But again, I would look at everything in balance. Um, you know, if you tell me, look, I'm drinking two pots of coffee, you might be becoming dehydrated, which can affect the metabolism of the meds you're on. You might be drinking, you know, coffee to excess and skipping meals that you actually might need some fuel. So my overall answer is that caffeine in and of itself is not a depressant. It's actually a stimulant. <laughs> it's a central nervous system stimulant. Um, but again, to a balance. If you have too much caffeine, it then can kind of, you get to a tipping point where you have decreased energy, lethargy, dehydration, that kind of thing. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, could the toxins be released from the cells? This was regarding the previous question. Okay. Yes. Could the toxins be released from the cells. In and of itself, weight loss, actually, d depending on how long you, you have been heavy or overweight, there aren't necessarily toxins within each individual cell, whether it's made up of you know, a, an adipose cell or whatever. Um, 
I think that to, to answer that, I would have to, to look more at all of the aspects of your health. There aren't toxins that are that are being released from any particular fat loss cells, those kinds of things in your body. I don't know if I'm articulating this enough for you. Um, I think that you might be having some toxicities in your system right now regarding um, what you're taking in, whether that be food, medicine, whatever it is, and how your body's responding to it. But in and of itself, losing weight does not cause a toxic um, environment in your body. I hope that satisfies that. Because yes, you know, if you've you. lost 80 pounds and had 80 pounds to lose, in and of itself, that is a positive, positive thing for you. And any um, toxicity, free radicals, that kind of thing that are going on in your system right now um, would not necessarily be linked to the fat loss. I would be looking for other avenues of, of things going on. But don't stop investigating it because I want you to feel well. Thank you, Susan. Next question. Mm -hmm. Gaining weight is a common side effect of antipsychotic medicine. Um, it's hard to feel well yes. or happy or content. What do you suggest in the situation to gain or maintain a positive outlook? Boy, that is the whole sum and summation of this webinar, isn't it? Um, I feel where, where you're at, uh, your struggle. First and foremost, I, you have to look at risk-benefit ratio. Is the med that you've been prescribed really doing a nice job of controlling your mood, any cycling, keeping you out of mania, keeping you out of suicidal depression. Um, that's one piece of it. And then looking at, okay, yeah, that's in balance, but I feel so just absolutely void of energy. I have no motivation. I've gained 15 pounds, which is actually now making me more depressed than I was before because you know what? Body image is a big part of it. And incorporating, you know, if I could speak to you personally, I would ask you, you know, is there anything in this slide that I talked about that you're not doing that you could add? Are you, you know, practicing the fake it till you make it? Um, phone a friend, have them meet you to walk, to exercise, um, you know, as often as you need it until you see some shifts um, in motivation and mood and energy. And you in particular and anyone who's prescribed a med that we know can contribute to some weight loss, you almost have to be perfect with um, choosing a really clean, clean diet. Um, you know, you you have to look at where in my diet, I was fine before I was on this med. Well, now I actually have to tighten up and make some dietary changes if I still want to fit in my clothes and if I want to have some energy. So making sure that you're getting all of those small frequent meals in, eliminating excess um, sugar and fast foods and doing all of those things and maybe adding or increasing your exercise. I mean, maybe you never had to before, and, but now you do. And that is a reality with some of those meds. I oftentimes will hand a person a prescription. Here's your new med and here's a pedometer. Make sure you're getting 10,000 steps a day in because you are probably going to gain some weight. And I want to decrease the amount of that happening for you. Does that help? I hope. Yes, thank you, Susan. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that's the last of our questions. So I want to say um, again, thank you for being here and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate your, your attention.